Welcome to Bible study. This is the Bible study we're preparing on the Gospel according to St. John. Uh, it's for the week of October 16th. We'll be talking about it uh, at that point. If you have any questions about it, always send me an email, let me know. Would love to know more and to hear from you and to talk more about this. This is wonderful stuff and I could spend my whole life just talking about these things. We're looking at John chapter 3. And so if you have your Bible handy, I'd encourage you to grab that, uh, follow along, be able to look at some of the things we're talking about and see uh, in the text some of the things that you're going to hear in this. John chapter 3 includes probably the most famous passage in uh, the New Testament for modern, particularly Protestant Christians. Um, John 3.16 is maybe the verse that more people know than any other. Uh, it, is, it is deeply ingrained, sort of considered to be the, the gospel in a nutshell. If you have engaged in some of the door-to-door -door evangelism techniques, it's oftentimes used there. And a lot of times they'll put your name in there, you know, for God so loved, and then put your name. Uh, a worthy way to think about this. This is a really powerful text. Uh, we're going to back up a little bit before John 3.16, take it from chapter 3, verse 1, and take, lead up to that, and then go a little bit past it, because the context, the surrounding material around there, only make that verse more and more important and influential. So turn to chapter 3 with me. Now, there was a Pharisee. We've already been introduced to these people, but for John's audience, these guys would have been... Uh, already well known. Those who John is writing to have already read the earlier three Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. What's more, the Jewish presence in the late Roman Empire has kind of elevated because of the rebellion of the Jewish people in the uh, in the latter part of the of the seventh decade of the century, in the six, late 60s and up to the year 70 AD, there was a rebellion, and it catapulted the Roman general who put the the rebellion down, catapulted him and his son and his second son right into the very emperorship of the whole Roman Empire, and so. Judaism, which had largely been a backwater thing inside uh, the Roman Empire, has kind of ascended a little bit in terms of public consciousness, but not for a good reason. There's a lot of people who look at these Jewish people as being somewhat ir almost irrational, a little bit crazy. You know, we, we tend to perceive of Jewish people as being somewhat bookish. You know, they, they're bankers and lawyers and doctors and, and the like, highly educated. Uh, in the first century, they were really perceived a lot of times as almost crazed religious fanatics. And so when, when, uh, when John drops this term that the Pharisee comes to him, there's a preload already in the mind of his audience about who that is. Those who have read the Gospels know that the Pharisees were in large part behind the death and crucifixion of Jesus. But the, uh, the larger Roman audience, who also are part of this, the audience to whom John is writing, these are largely Gentile Christians, they also know these Jews in another way. And that is through that, that process of rebellion. And it's actually not an un, unreasonable thing that they have suspicions of them. Because about 40 years after John writes this, the Jewish nation in Israel rises up in revolt, revolt again. And uh, again the Romans have to come in. And this time they, they just wipe out uh, the city of Jerusalem. They just scrape it. And uh, they move all the Jews out. They won't let any of them live there anymore. They resettle it with Gentiles, and they name the city after the god Jupiter. I mean, they, they want to really exterminate this zealotry that Judaism has for the city of Jerusalem and for uh, the cause of, the, of free Israel. So this Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews, he came to Jesus by night, and he said to him, Rabbi, he came by night. 
that is really important in the Gospel of John. John sees, one of the words we heard in the, in the prologue is that John wants you to see Jesus as the light of the world. Coming, and so the opposite of light is dark. And so by coming at night in the dark, Nicodemus is very clearly being associated with the powers of darkness. You want to really pay attention to this light and dark theme as it runs through, uh, through the gospel. We're going to come in a few chapters later to a man who was born blind, uh, and he is in the dark. But really, other people are more in the dark even than he is. You want to, John plays with this a lot. We know, says Nicodemus, that you are a teacher who has come from God. For no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. So they're having a hard time rationalizing who's this, this Jesus is saying some strange things, but he also is validated by the miraculous signs that he has done. And so Nicodemus comes at night. Probably in Nicodemus's point of view is to uh, make this a secret embassy so that, so that the... The, the rest of the leaders of the Jews don't even know that he is there. But for John, John wants you to notice that this is coming out of the darkness. Jesus answered him, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. In John, you also want to play with the idea that seeing and knowing and believing are almost synonymous terms. We do this in English, too. If somebody's trying to explain something to us, we might say, oh, I see what you mean. Well, really what we mean is I understand. I know what you're talking about. But we oftentimes use that metaphorical way of just talking about knowledge of seeing. Very frequently in English, they did very frequently in Greek too. This would not have been unusual for them. So he sees. All right. So John, so Jesus says, can you even see the kingdom of God? You can't see it unless you are born from above. And so John has Jesus noticing that Nicodemus is starting to see. But now, Nicodemus, but what John wants you to notice about that is that the seeing that Nicodemus has, the I see that you are from God, that, that knowledge, that seeing, that, that understanding is also from God. In other words, even though he is in the dark, Nicodemus has been given some insight. He's been given some light that he could see. But he can only see dimly. Nicodemus said to him, how can anyone be born again after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Nicodemus is having a hard time seeing where Jesus is using metaphor, where Jesus is using, using literal terms. Nicodemus is, Nicodemus is having a hard time of it. Now, for John's audience, who sometimes maybe are encountering a Jesus who is difficult to understand, this could be good news. That, in fact, Jesus, from the very beginning, the very people who should have known him best, they struggled to understand Jesus. Do you struggle to understand what Jesus is doing? Yes, I do too. That's a pretty normal human experience of Jesus, is he sometimes does things that are to our ears and eyes inexplicable. And so John has Nicodemus just sort of fumbling around here. How does this work? Jesus answered him, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and the Spirit. There's no way to get around baptismal language here. This is what he's talking about. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the Spirit is spirit. 
You may want to go back just a couple pages to the prologue where uh, in verses 1 through 18 of chapter 1 where he says that the, to those who believe he gives the power to become the children of God. Not children not born of the will of a father. Okay? But, but of, of the flesh. Not born of a human sort of way but born of the will of God born of the spirit now we're seeing that element in the prologue coming forward and being further explicated further expanded upon right here in chapter 3 do not be astonished that I said to you that you must be born from above the wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. Well, again, Jesus is playing a little bit here with us, or John is in these words. Um, in the Greek language, there is only one word for spirit and wind and breath. It's all the same word. It, by the way, is the same word in Hebrew Aramaic too, the language Jesus and Nicodemus were speaking, and that works the same way in English. In English, we get the word um, pneumatic, as in a, the, the air pressure in a tire. Um, that's the word that Jesus is using here, the pneuma. The pneuma can be the wind, it can be the the spirit, it can be the breath that a person breathes. They're all the same word. It's just one word in Greek. It uses that one word to mean all three different things. And so Jesus is playing. He says, you see the pneuma blowing around in the wind, in the trees. You see it, you know, shaking the trees, branches, and it just blows wherever it wants. You don't know. Sometimes it blows from the east, sometimes from the west. It's the wind. And so it is with the spirit, with the pneuma of God. It blows in all kinds of directions, and it does what it is going to do. Don't be surprised that it does something strange or unusual or different for you. It blows where it chooses. You hear the sound of it, and you don't know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit that this is not in your control. This is not yours to do. God tends to show up, and I don't know if you've noticed this, he tends to show up and do things in places where I least expect him, where I am not looking for him. That sometimes means he isn't necessarily in the church where I am, that he might be blowing somewhere else too. Nicodemus said to him, I don't understand. How can these things be? And Jesus answered him, Are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? I love this little interchange that we've gotten so far between Jesus and Nicodemus because, you know, it really, it really sounds like me sometimes. And I think it really sounds like you. The, uh, John is, is casting a net wide. And in this passage with Nicodemus, including a lot of people who are, who are in conversation with Jesus, and they don't always get it. And I think what John is really saying is that's not the problem. I mean, it is a problem that you don't understand, that you don't believe, or that you don't perceive what Jesus is doing. But ultimately, what you want to do is look at Jesus and listen to what he says. Now, for the reader and for us, what Jesus is saying here isn't particularly perplexing because having the gift of baptism in the Holy Spirit, and we talk about baptismal regeneration and new birth all the time, that this John's conversation doesn't seem, or Jesus' conversation with Nicodemus doesn't seem strange to us. We have a hard time making it strange a little bit for us again. But I don't think it stops with just the story and the, the understanding of baptism. I think it goes on. And we're going to go there in just a moment. As God talks, of, as Jesus talks about the even greater, stranger mystery of what is yet to come. 
very truly I tell you. And here in verse 11, John does another little switch. This is why we ask our pastors and people who would study theology to learn Greek. Um, in Greek, it has a different form of the singular you and the plural you. You might think of it as y'all. Here in chapter 3, verse 11, it suddenly switches to a you plural. It's almost as if you're, you're talking to, or you're, you're, you're watching this little vignette between, this tableau between, between um, Nicodemus and Jesus on a television screen, and all of a sudden Jesus turns and looks right into the camera, right at you, and he starts talking about you all. Very truly, I tell you all, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen, yet you do not receive our testimony. You're like Nicodemus. You're a little thick. If I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? This is really John, in a sense, talking through Jesus to the to the audience that he has, to the people he is talking to. And we believe that John is actually addressing a community of people who are struggling to understand Jesus and who he is and what he has done. No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. Here's the claim. Jesus of Nazareth, the guy who is sitting in the dark with Nicodemus right here talking, that Jesus has descended from heaven. That Jesus is a heavenly Jesus. Just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. All of a sudden now, John grabs an Old Testament passage right out of the Torah. It's in Numbers chapter 21. And I encourage you to go back and read that story. It's the story of uh, uh, Moses and the people of Israel out in the wilderness. They are complaining about what is going on. God sends snakes into the camp and they start biting people. They're venomous and they start dying. And the people pray, God, take the snakes away. Actually, they asked Moses to pray for them. Moses prays for the people. And God answers the prayer by not taking away the snakes. In fact, he doesn't take away any snakes. He gives them another one. He has Moses construct a snake out of bronze, put it up on a pole. And now, if people look at that snake that is up on the pole, even though they are bit by one of the poisonous serpents, they won't die from that. The people asked to have the snakes taken away. They didn't get taken away, they got another one. And what's very interesting about that little story is that the solution looks very much like the problem. The solution to the snakes on the ground is the snake on the pole. The solution to the death that is around me now is the Son of Man dying on a cross. The solution to the injustice and the problems that I see in my world, of which I am subject and I have, it seems like, no way to escape, is the injustice of the one innocent man who ever lived, dying a torturous and awful death by crucifixion. You see how that works? So must the Son of Man be lifted up that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Now, even though we may have understood what Nicodemus and Jesus were talking about in terms of baptism, now we come to this mystery that is unfathomable. How does that work? And yet, we believe and we trust. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever, that anyone who believes in him, who faiths in him, remember that word, may not perish, may not die, 
may not be utterly dissolved, but may have eternal life. The, that this is now the profound mystery, which it's a good thing to be able to say like Nicodemus, I don't understand. Because it's deep and it's big. Part of the problem that John has with the people who are living in his day is they think they have it figured out. They understand it. And what John is really trying, I think, to get them to say is, there is no understanding this. God loved the world this way, that he gave his son over into death on a cross and to, and to suffer. And somehow, in God's way, that is the solution to the world. There is the light. There is the true knowledge. There is... everything that Nicodemus needs in you and me. Indeed, God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Jesus' first coming is not a coming in judgment. It is a coming in grace. It is a coming in salvation and rescue. This is a metaphor of Jesus and what he is doing, you need to understand, is, is, is really more of Christ the victor, Christ the rescuer, Christ the lifeguard, who is rescuing us from the reality in which we live, that we are trapped in, the darkness that, that, has, that, that would otherwise overwhelm us. That Jesus comes into this world to rescue us and to bring us out. It's not antithetical to, but he's not really talking here about, you know, Jesus dying in our place. Um, that's here, but that's not really what he's talking about. He's talking much more about we are being rescued out of darkness and into light. Those who believe in him are not condemned. But those who do not believe are condemned already. It's not that their disbelief condemns them, they're condemned already. In other words, they are already subject to this darkness, to this reality that we can't escape from. The only way out of that is through Jesus, is to trust, believe, pistis, to fave in him. Because they have not believed in the name of the only son, God's only son. And this is the judgment. Light has come into the world, and the people preferred their darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. They would rather cling to the darkness that they know than live in the light that saves. For all who do evil hate the light and do not come into the light so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come into the light so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. Here we're starting to get one of the main crux themes we think is living in the basement, if you will, of the gospel according to John. He seems to be writing to a group of people who think they got this Jesus thing figured out. And that, in fact, what Jesus is calling for is this separation between the physical and the spiritual. John says there's a separation. There's darkness and there's light. But it's not a separation between physical and non-corporeal, spiritual in that sense. That in fact, the light is found in the doing of deeds. The light will be found in the feeding of a hungry person, in the comforting of someone who grieves, in the, in the clothing of someone who doesn't have enough, in the care of the person who is in need. That is the light in John's idea. Those are the ones who do those things that come out. They are in the light. It is the people who, either through apathy or malevolence, don't help and harm their neighbor. That is the darkness. John's audience, this group of people, this group of early Christians who think they have Jesus figured out, are saying that, no, 
what really matters are the spiritual things, and that hence the suffering of my neighbor, my uh, the uh, the hunger, the, depra- the, the 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 deprivation, whatever of the person who is over there. That isn't the real problem. The real problem is a spiritual. Darkness, And that's real handy because that lets you keep all the stuff you have that you enjoy and you don't have to share anything because now, now it's a spiritual problem. But John wants to smash that. It is not a difference between spiritual and physical. It is rather a difference between spiritual and carnal or self-interest. That that the things of this world can be very spiritual. That the deeds we do, the love we give, the, the mercy, the care, those are spiritual. They're work, and they sometimes are hard to do, and they are oftentimes involving sacrifice. But so it is that the real solution God has for us is not Jesus leaving this world, but it is Jesus on that cross, dying. Red, sticky blood dropping to the earth, dying. That, as Moses lifted up the serpent, a problem, a solution that looked a lot like the problem. So Jesus lifted up is the solution to the sin and the darkness and all the problems. If you think you got that figured out, I'd love to hear it. But don't worry if you don't. I think that's just where John wants you to be. Standing in awe of the mystery of God. Talk to you more about this. We'll see you Sunday. God bless you all.